This is a micro lecture on the concept of thinking aloud while reading to students in order to teach them comprehension strategies so that they can use them and apply them when they read. And it draws on a couple of big ideas in reading instruction and one of those is the whole concept of externalizing one's thinking in order for students to internalize those same prompts and statements so that they might use them themselves. Drawing on Vygotsky, for example. It also draws on this idea of the gradual release of responsibility or that I'll do it and through my modeling I want students and myself to do it together in partners or with myself and then I want students eventually to do it on their own so it kind of follows the I do, we do, you do model. In I do I use a text for example House on Mango Street I read aloud to students stopping to think aloud briefly and externalize my thinking with certain prompts that I want students to use and incorporate in their speech and their reading. And so I might read a little bit and name the what, why, when, and how of the strategy. This strategy is going to be inferencing or drawing conclusions. So I name it. The what of the strategy is inferencing. And what it is is I read between the lines. I add my own schema to what the author provides. And I have new ideas as I read. And I do this all the time when I read because all the information isn't stated explicitly or directly right there in the text. So I have to bring in some information to the text and make new ideas and form those new ideas. And I use this frequently, fiction and nonfiction. In this case, it's fiction and I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do it. So I'll show you the procedures as I stop and think aloud about my name. In English, my name means hope. In Spanish, it means too many letters. It means sadness. It means waiting. It is like the number nine, a muddy color. I have to think back and remember her name is Esperanza. It literally means hope. I know that from my Spanish classes in high school that I learned that vocabulary word. She seems to have mixed emotions about her name. I'm going to keep reading and see if she does like her name or not. I'm predicting that she doesn't at this point. It is the Mexican records my father plays on Sunday mornings when he is shaving. Songs like sobbing. Hmm, that seems to be a metaphor. It's like it is the Mexican records her father plays. I can almost hear those records playing in the background. It was my great-grandmother's name, and now it is mine. Hmm, she inherited that name. I think there may be a little bit of pride in there with her name. This is a complicated little story here. I'm going to have to really think about this. Another way I can think aloud is about genre. I might want to think aloud about this idea that authors can take science and turn it into a poem, like in Zoo's Who by Doug Florian. So I might show students the pictures, I might show students the poem, and I might read a few and think aloud about genre itself and show them the possibilities of literature. Something else I can do is think aloud with nonfiction. A good strategy for science, like in the text of Seymour Simon, is question generating. So I pose questions before I read the text. I'm drawn and captivated by this picture and the title itself. I'm intrigued, and so I'll think aloud and ask questions. I ask questions to myself as a reader while I read, and after I'm done with the book, I still have questions. So again, I teach the what, why, when, and how framework I drew upon from reading Jeff Wilhelm's text, on Thinking Aloud, and I'm going to tell students those things. The strategy is called questioning. I use it when I want to know things, when I'm very curious and I really do have questions of the text. Sometimes I find answers in the text itself. Other times I have to go look elsewhere in resources like maybe Google or the Internet or a person or another text. So I'm always searching for answers to questions. And if I find them, great. If I don't, I look on. And I use this all the time, especially when I read science. You know, science is inquiry and science is posing questions. And so we should always really be posing questions of science and I'm going to show you how to use it right now. What I do is I think about the topic. And what do I know? What's my prior knowledge? I know that I kind of think snakes are icky, to be honest, but I want to know more about snakes and give them a chance. Hmm, I'm wondering what kind of snake this is. I really don't have a lot of prior knowledge about snakes. So I'm going to go ahead and start reading and see what I can learn. 
Let's see. It says snakes can't walk or run, but they have at least three ways of moving. I wonder what they are. Most snakes loop along the ground or other surface such as a tree branch to move forward. A snake draws its body into a series of curves and then suddenly straightens out. How does it know how to do that? As each loop pushes backward against the surface, part of the snake moves forward. Snakes can move quickly this way, but most snakes can be easily outdistanced by a running person. I'm really glad to hear that. A kind of squeeze box motion is used by some burrowing snakes. Hmm, I kind of know what burrowing means. I think it means going into the ground. Do they really burrow deep like a mole would do? I'm wondering what that means, burrowing. I'm going to read on and find out. The snake coils itself together and throws the front end of its body forward. Then the snake anchors its front end along the sides of the burrow and pulls its tail forward. Hmm, it seems to be a way of moving. Snakes with thick bodies, such as boas, ah, like boa constrictor, can also inch along the ground in a kind of caterpillar motion. Oh, I get it. It's not entirely going underground. He's just sort of inching along. And the comparison to a caterpillar really helped me figure out what burrowing meant in that context. So that's another strategy I can use. I think it's really important that we empower students with as many strategies as we can, but use them in honest and authentic ways. And one of the best pieces of advice I've heard with Thinking Aloud is as a teacher to go through the text and, you know, note and be aware of your own authentic responses to the text so that you can share those with students and they'll greatly benefit. This is a really powerful research strategy, Thinking Aloud, and I hope you can try it in your classroom.